so everyone is aware. Okay. I think, it, should we go ahead and make a start and then as, as folks join, um, I'll just kind of let them in as well. Um, here we go. I'm just going to pull up some housekeeping slides. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome everybody to today's session on inherited cardiac conditions. We're so glad that you're here to join. Oops, here we go. Uh, can you see my slides? Yeah, all oh, good. Yeah, we can. Jessica. Okay. Oops. Okay. Is that? Oh, yeah. Okay, so thanks for all that. Just a few notes, we are joined by our Inherited Cardiac Conditions or ICC experts uh, with Rachel Bastianen, Liam Tobin, and Liz Wilson, who will be giving us some very practical information about ICC, the services in our South London tertiary sites and uh, referral criteria and some pathway information. So just as we get started, I just wanted to note a few of the very typical housekeeping rules. We ask that you please keep your microphone on mute. We will have a Q&A session at the, end of, um, at the end of the presentation. And if you'd like to, of course, ask your questions, then we'd be happy to answer them. If you do think of anything as we go along, feel free to add them to the chat box and we'll address them then. We are recording this session, so if you would prefer your camera to be off, feel free to turn that off. Um, we will be posting this onto our YouTube page, our South London Cardiovascular Networks YouTube page, and the um, handle is down at the bottom of the screen there, so it should be up hopefully uh, this evening or so. Um, to obtain your certificate of attendance after this, you'll be sent an email with a feedback form. You must please complete that feedback form, which will then generate the attendance certificate for you thereafter. And if you'd like to see any other sessions or other news from the South London networks, please feel free to uh, visit our website, which is listed there. It's got news and uh, recent publications and reports as well. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Liz to join to present and start and I will stop sharing. Thanks so much, Andrew, and a, a special thank you to you and Joe and whoever else has uh, worked very hard to put this together for us today. Um, I'm just going to concentrate a second while I pull up my slides. How is that for everybody? Can you see? Wonderful. Andrea, I can't see any chat stuff um, or admit anybody, so I'd be very grateful if you can um, help me out with that. You got it. Thank you. So um, good afternoon, everybody. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, so my name's Liz. I'm a clinical nurse specialist in inherited cardiac conditions based at King's College Hospital. I'm very fortunate to be joined today by uh, Rachel Bastianen, who's a consultant cardiologist and also our clinical lead for ICC um, across King's Health Partners, and also Liam Tobin, who is our lead uh, CNS uh, for ICC, also across uh, King's Health Partners. So I'm hoping to keep this brief, um, but we just wanted to give about 10 minutes or so to, to give a brief overview, um, it, as Andrea said, with some practical hints and tips in there as well. Uh, to begin with, just to say who we are and, and what we do, because uh, not everybody is familiar with our service, uh, what conditions we look after, but I won't be getting bogged down in the details there. It will just be very, very brief, but um, with some guidance as to where to find more information. Um, how we can support um, both uh, our patient groups and, of course, yourselves in terms uh, of, of ICC patients and also uh, why um, we uh, bang on about referring to us all of the time. Uh, some practical tips as to how you can, which I hope is something that's relatively simple and easy for you to, to access. Um, some informal contacts for some general queries as well, because I think it's important that you have access to us if there is anything. Um, and the majority of the conversation hopefully will be uh, a little bit of uh, sort of discussion between all of us in terms of uh, what's been working uh, and what we can potentially work together with in terms of, of improving. So we are not only a service that uh, works across cardiovascular, and uh, clinical genetics in order to provide integrated care for our patients with genetic heart conditions. 
Uh, but we also work across sites. So we work across King's Health Partners. So that's Guys and St Thomas's and uh, King's College Hospital. Unfortunately, we don't have a representative for Georgia's today, but I'm poised at the ready if you want me to pass on any queries and there's also some contact information for them. And we're very fortunate to have an excellent network um, that we all work together with. Um, and we also work uh, across or work closely with subspecialities such as heart failure, EP and uh, the cardiac surgeons. So it's a very, very intricate and sometimes very complex um, service. But what we aim to do is provide care for our patients with inherited cardiac conditions for the day to day, as well as screening their first degree relatives. So that's parents, siblings and children who, of course, are at risk of, of um, having the same condition through inheritance. This is a group of patients that have a higher risk of, of rhythm problems, for example, sudden death, cardiac arrest. Um, so we do a uh, very um, frequent risk assessment for that. And of course, genetic testing in order to mm -hmm. hopefully give us a, an underlying genetic cause, um, as well as to offer some testing to the wider family as well. So th this is a very busy slide, but uh, on the right is uh, a, a list of the kind of conditions that we look after. Um, so we're an adult service, but of course we do have the Evelina, which is our, our paediatric sort of branch uh, linked in with uh, St Thomas's as well. And I won't go through them all, but basically we look after the inherited heart muscle as well as uh, inherited arrhythmia. We do uh, work at uh, guys with the uh, syndromic and non-syndromic uh, aortopathies. And increasingly, a lot of work has gone into uh, groups of patients with unexplained cardiac arrests and, of course, sudden cardiac death in the family and super specialist, the, the mitochondrial that um, we don't see very often as it's much rarer. But of course, those patients are out there. And the diagram on the left is just um, it, it's symbolic more than anything. And it's just there to symbolise the fact that you may well have one patient that's got um, an, an, a heart condition that could be genetic or is genetic. But there's always so many others um, out there uh, in terms of relatives that we should really be seeing. Now, I don't expect people to remember all of that. So we're very fortunate through the ERS system to have a directory of service. I'm sure everybody's got tons of time to claw through all of this information and I appreciate everybody's very busy um, but there is we have recently updated across guys in St Thomas's and Kings the um, the service information so I hope um, that it is useful in terms of, of what kind of patients we look after and, and some further advice in regards to the paediatric service what kind of tests we do um, and some sort of appointment practical information as well when when patients are getting booked in through the, the choose and book system. So that's a lot of responsibility. There are a lot of, uh, certainly for screening patients, there are a lot of people out there with no symptoms, no symptom driven care being asked for. Uh, they just come in with a vague notion that someone's told them that they need to be referred to an ICC service for screening, which is not very helpful for, for you a lot of the time. Um, so we do try to, to assist where we can with that. So just a couple of points to say with patients that have inherited heart conditions, they should have long term follow up. So there should be patients for life somewhere. Um, there are caveats to that and it doesn't necessarily need to be in a very, you know, sort of specialist ICC service. But we would always recommend that patients get some kind of ICC input um, initially, particularly if they've moved area um, or if they're transitioning uh, from paediatric to, to adult um, because things can get missed. So it would be great if we are all very vigilant about that. Um, as I said about screening for first degree relatives, so you uh, I don't know if the letter on the right is familiar, but you may occasionally get patients coming in um, again, not always understanding what it means. Uh, but this is a letter that we provide uh, mostly through the CNSs such as myself in order to help sort of facilitate referral into the service for first degree relatives. And it's normally for relatives that are out of our area, if that makes sense. So. You may well get these letters with all kinds of, you know, Southampton and various other hospitals, and that's just facilitating that uh, relative having screening locally. 
And also we know that we when we do clerking for patients, we talk a lot about history of sudden cardiac death and unexplained cardiac arrests. Um, but it's just important to note that actually the follow the follow up of that is that we're very interested in seeing uh, patients that are, uh, have that kind of history. And this is uh, just again, it's it's another symbolic slide um, of, of the intricacies of, of what we look after in ICC. So for those of you that aren't familiar, this is a family tree, a family pedigree. For a, this is an actual family that we're caring for at King's at the minute. Um, and uh, what you can see there uh, or not see, depending on how well I've uh, labelled it, is an incredibly um, tragic history of sudden death, mostly uh, young deaths. Um, one fortunate family member who had a cardiac arrest and, and survived it, and he was, he's in his early 20s. And then uh, some known uh, likely dilated cardiomyopathy in other family members. And the ones with the kind of shady boxes are the ones that we, we know about. And if you look at that, there are majority of them are people we don't know about. And these are people that I uh, at work tirelessly to try and bring into the service for screening. But of course, these are all people that be coming to their GP surgeries and, and coming into primary care for other reasons. And it's just really um, showing the importance of talking about family history and how much of an impact it can make for families. So in regards to the pathway, so um, as far as I know, um, certainly across uh, King's Health Partners and I'd confirmed with George's, everything goes through Choose and Book, so through the ERS system in terms of referrals for yourself. Uh, there's a primary triage process, which I'm sure you're aware of, um, which is done by either a consultant or a nurse, depending on the, the site. Those patients then come in for a telephone triage or a, a, a video consult with one of the nurse team in order to make sure we've got that family pedigree and we've got family information and we, you know, we're, we're doing everything we need to be doing um, in preparation um, for their uh, consultant um, appointment, which is generally face to face. Of course, the follow up from that, um, probably lots of tests because we love tests, uh, likely some genetic testing, though not always. We, we're very clear that not everybody, there's criteria for genetic testing. So um, that's a decision that we make in clinic. And of course, these are families that are very complex, lots of the time uh, highly traumatized um, and very anxious. So we give lots of specialist support and education where we can as well. And of course, in terms of outcome, more often than not, we keep them patients for life, as I've said before. Um, but of course, for our screening group, um, you may see letters from us um, that very annoyingly say, uh, please, can you re-refer in three years time? And just to be clear, we do tell patients to self-advocate and we always catch up with the, the affected, what we call probands, to remind them about screening. So we don't put all of that on you, um, even though it might look like it. Um, so just some important points quickly, because I've gone over time. Um, we like to assess um, all patients with, with an ICC, even if they're going to end up with long term sort of follow up elsewhere, if they don't have anything in place. If they're already known to a service or they've already gone through an IC service, ICC service and they've got follow up, great. Um, but these are patients that really should always have follow up unless they're, you know, um, sort of very advanced years and, and everything's very stable. Um, it is relevant when there's death in the family um, and I think in old we would have said 40, 45, but we're looking at under 60s um, now in terms of relevance. But don't get too bogged down on the um, on the age either, because, you know, it, it, looking at the history as a whole, it could still be relevant if they're over 60. Um, with patients that come for, for screening, um, so for those family members, we do have certain protocols and, and we're incredibly thorough uh, because we have the time to be able to do that. So we do recommend that all patients come in for screening through an ICC service as opposed to having tests done locally. And then um, as you probably not used to a lot of the people that come and ask for screening uh, they can be asymptomatic so um that's another reason why it's important to come to the icc service because we know what tests to give them even if it's not symptom driven um with us 
and screening is very rarely there is caveats to that certain conditions but it's very rarely ever a one-off these are patients that we like to see coming back and back and back again until again advanced years where we think we're comfortable they're not going to have any problems so I, again, I'm hoping you're very familiar with the Choose and Book the ERS um, system. We also have advice and guidance, um, but it's really important that you have access to us for general queries as well, because you know you may well have sort of general questions about certain groups of patients. So I've made sure, and I'm, I'm assuming your these slides will be shared as well as obviously everything going on YouTube um, for guys in St Thomas's King's College and St George's. There's some contact uh, emails there for you as well. Um, we wouldn't be able to accept referrals through those though it would literally just be for, for general queries. So I'm gonna shut up um, so hopefully hear back from from yourselves in regards to your experiences and any sort of questions. Um, I'm going to turn off the screen share because I like to see faces otherwise I get a bit uh, I don't really know what's going on. Um, so of course any questions about anything that I've just said any experiences you're having, what's working, what's not working. We, we're very, very open to feedback and anything that we can do to support. Um, and then, of course, anything that needs to be taken forward um, as well. And just to let you know, there's some further information about our services at those websites that, um, that you'll have access to as well. Thank you so much. Thanks for right. that, Liz. Back in Appreciate. the room. <laughs> Liam, Rachel, did you have anything that you wanted to add? Kind of put you on the spot there, sorry. No, that's fine. Um, I think Liz has uh, given us a lovely presentation and really lovely summary um, of the service. Um, you know, I, I think just to, to reiterate that, you know, ICC inherited conditions, they're not your commonest conditions. I We completely appreciate that and and you'll probably only have a handful of patients um, where who are affected. Um, and as such, we are very happy to answer questions and queries. And I think that um, the advice and guidance through ERS can be very helpful as well for that, just to, to highlight that. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention was, yes, I think that us asking you for screening um, re referrals every few years is not the best method. Um, and we are hoping we've already started it at Guys and St Thomas's but across the patch to be able to use the, the PFU pathways, the patient initiated follow up pathways, so that that doesn't need to be uh, the case in the future. So. That would mean just one referral and then we can continue to see that person every three to five years generally until the age of 60 um, if needed. And then the only other thing I guess I wanted to say was I think that you know we at present see most ICC patients in in big centres so we've talked about Kings, we've talked about Georges, we've talked about Guys and St Thomas's but I think um, networks of care and we already have a um, growing network within the southeast region that allows more local follow-up for the correct patients is hopefully going to develop further I think in, in years to come and and will be a way um, to look after patients closer to home with um, within sort of hub and spoke type ICC clinics um, uh, you know, and therefore, hopefully, with with closer involvement um, in that sort of primary secondary care interface, because we're aware of the fact that many patients come a very long way to see us, and it probably feels all quite disconnected and disjointed. But in any way that we can help and answer questions for you, we're very happy to. So, thanks for listening today. Thanks, Rachel. Liam, did you want to add anything? Or we do also have a question in the chat that I can pose. I don't think I've got anything to add uh, beyond what uh, Liz has already presented and, and, and Rachel uh, said. Thank you. OK, um, so from Kate Proctor, um, we've got, would you like us to do any investigation in our GP's scene, or, uh, scene before referring, such as ECG or ECHO? 
So I, I'm I'm happy to pick up on that. I, I think um, having an ECG is really, really helpful, actually, and hopefully something that's fairly easy uh, to access for you. It does depend slightly on the type of referral. I think a patient um, who there's a query of a diagnosis and who has symptoms, um, having a little bit of data to base the referral on or as much data as possible is really helpful. The screening appointments where it's affected, you know, first degree relatives of affected family members, there's less need uh, unless that person um, is complaining of symptoms because we will do all of that in a one stop shop. So the first um, appointment in the pathway, as Liz mentioned, is with one of our nurses who will um, gather any relevant clinical genetic family information, including drawing that family pedigree. And then the next appointment will usually be face to face with a consultant or within a dedicated screening clinic. And all of the new patients will tend to get an ECG and an echo on that first appointment. Some of them may get a treadmill as well, particularly those who have uh, queries around inherited arrhythmia um, problems or syndromes. Um, so it's not necessary, but can be helpful. And I would say that the patients that it's most useful for ECG and possibly echo are patients who have symptoms um, and where you know we're aware of the fact that there may be a number of weeks wait before they progress through the uh, you know through the system and see us if they've got symptoms having that data if, if those tests can be done more rapidly and sending that into us is really helpful because it helps us to triage them and prioritize them appropriately as well for asymptomatic screening patients absolutely no need to do that we'll do it all I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I would I would just echo that um, as as well. Carry on what you what you're doing and what you do so well in terms of of treat of uh, symptom assessment. Um, but as as somebody that does the triage um, of the referrals, um, it's always great to know uh, if you're worried about I, I I can I can almost tell from the tone of referral sometimes if you're worried about a patient and that's really good to know because what I didn't say in my presentation is that we we do have long waits. Um, in some cases to, for patients to see us, uh, not horrendous, um, but obviously we want to make sure that we're capturing because of that higher risk of, of sudden death and arrhythmia and various other awful things, um, any assistance we can have to, to capture the more urgent patients and get them through the pipeline quicker is, is always great. Great, thanks for that. Like I said, we encourage your um, questions in the chat box or if you'd like to raise your hand and just ask them overtly, please be my guest. Uh, we could do that too. Um, while we're just waiting to see if there are any other questions, um, I will just uh, let everybody know that um, the South London networks are also planning some other educational sessions in future. And if there are any topics that you would like to hear, we encourage you to let us know what they may be. We are planning some talks on aortic dissection, chest pain, heart, fail, heart failure, valve disease, and some prevention and uh, lipids information as well. So hopefully those will be of interest. But if, like I say, if there's anything else that you'd like to hear about or learn about, please let us know and we can see if we can arrange that in this upcoming year as we plan out our events. Can I ask a question? Am I allowed? Please, of course. <laughs> has, has anyone referred to us? Has anyone had a patient come through the, the the pathway. I'd just be really interested to to hear um how easy it was and how smooth it went or or not smooth. We were okay if you d if it wasn't. Um, but it'd just be good to hear from the other side of things. If anyone would like to share their experience, please feel free. We are rare, so I guess I should have anticipated this <laughs> very awkward silence after that. OK, good to know. The quiet group, didn't they? <laughs> 
Okay. Well, I don't see any other questions in the chat and it doesn't look like anyone's typing, but I do want to thank everyone for coming out and I, I especially want to thank our speakers and presenters. Liz in particular, thank you for uh, helping to arrange this. Rachel and Liam, as always, do appreciate. And I would say thank you. And I guess if unless you have any closing words too, Liz, Rachel, Liam. Uh, I was I was only going to say um, if, if anything crops up or if you're feeling particularly shy today, um, uh, Andrew, are, they, uh, are the slides going up? You said about the YouTube, sorry, are the slides going up as well with all our contact info? Yes, so if you go to the South London Cardiovascular Network's website, there's a link at the top that says news. We will post a link to the YouTube session, the slides, um, et cetera, et cetera, and they'll have my contact information there as well. So I can, I'd be more than happy to forward out some any questions that happen. Amazing. We're a very friendly bunch, so please don't be afraid to, to get in contact if you have any any questions. We're super, super keen to to make this a process that works for everybody, certainly the patients. But, um, you know, we, we want to work closely with, with you because you're so paramount to, to us in order to get this work done um very important so uh please don't be afraid to to reach out um if there's anything you need and that's it from me i did all the talking <laughs> can i can i ask something sorry it's kate proctor again can i just ask something quickly um so the reason i asked that question before is i basically had a patient who came in the other day who thinks she has a family history but you know lots of our patients have are told or oh, you have to get screening but they don't really know and the parents or sibling haven't passed on the information well enough for them to be clear when they come to us so what <clears throat> what do you need very detailed information is it worth trying to get a hospital letter from somebody or if there's a history of a some sort of myopathy can we just make a referral um, so you're welcome to make a referral if there's a, a family history and, and we can do some digging, but but we would be very grateful if you ask them to reach out to their family members. Now, fa families are complex and sometimes that doesn't always work because there isn't always, uh, there aren't always perfect channels of communication within them. Um, but getting as much information as possible is really helpful. Don't let that stop you from referring, so please go ahead and refer. But if you can also say to the patient, they're going to ask you lots and lots of questions about your family and about the details. And um, please go and spend the next, you know, few weeks gathering as much information as possible. If possible, getting uh, hospital um, letters from relatives or death certificates or postmortems if somebody has passed away. That kind of fact finding is really, really helpful, and that's what we spend a lot of time talking to them about in that first appointment. But obviously then there's a few weeks that passes with them doing it. So if you can get them doing that early, that's massively helpful. We could make the referral and they could be doing the fact finding in the meantime. Exactly. Brilliant. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. We, Great. we give Thank them a lot of homework, Kate. They they have to go and find postmortems and death certificates and all kinds of things. So okay. um, you'll, you'll be preparing them for the storm when they come through my triage clinic and I ask them for all that. Um, okay. And the key word there is that they've been told to have screening. If I yeah. read that in a referral, I click accept. I okay. don't, because, because if I triage them and it's not relevant, then yeah. that's it. They, they don't go forward with anything else. I mean, it's very rare. We normally just do everybody, but um, the triage is there as a, in order for me to find all those, to have the time to find all those details. Um, it's not, that's not for you to do really. It's for the patient to do, but I facilitate that in the, the clinics. That's great. Thank you. looks like we have another question in the chat and I'm probably going to uh, mess up this name. So uh, check out Sothi if you'd like to go ahead with your question. Uh, about uh, MAGP in Merton, um, about um, inherited arrhythmia syndromes, other than ventricular fibrillation asystole, is there, are there a lot of subtypes? So yes, there are, there are lots of different types. Um, Probably 
the most or the more common ones that you come across would be something called long QT syndrome or Brigada syndrome. That being said, neither of those are so common that you're likely to have um, many affected patients, if any, potentially. So, I mean, I think, you know, that there are lots of different types for sure. You don't need to um, give us lots of details around that. Um, if it's a patient who it, it, the query is whether they have one because they're symptomatic, um, then we will be doing the workup for that. So of course, a number of those patients, I guess it's it's probably important to recognise, may not come to us directly. If you have a patient who's getting palpitations, perhaps, or had a blackout, but without there being an obvious family history of an inherited condition, they may well see a general cardiologist or a, an electrophysiologist first who will run the first set of tests and we receive a lot of referrals internally from other colleagues. That being said, there will be some people who are asymptomatic and need screening and of course refer them directly to us. Um, and those who have symptoms with a family history, please refer directly to us. And anyone who, who you're concerned about, uh, you know, blackout is the is, is a red flag for most inherited conditions in all reality. So people who have passed out, if there's a suspicion that they may have an underlying inherited condition, they're the people we want to see urgently. Now, of course, the majority of people black out because they have a simple faint, but we can do the work up to try and understand that better. So for me, the biggest red flag is a blackout. Thank you. And I, and I would just add to that as well. We I don't we don't we're trying to shy away a bit from focusing on it, but um, but, you know, also age. We we don't want to discount young patients that are symptomatic, um, because that's majority of I I should have put it on the slide. The majority of our patients are younger. So you know, if you're if you've got a young person that's got palpitations, and then you do a, a, an ambulatory ECG, and and something's not right on that and you've got the family history um you know they're all red flags that the symptoms the family history and also um uh, age as well great thank you for that um any other questions that we may have or experiences that you want to share about your patients going through these pathways No, it was silent before and then we had a flurry of questions. So what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> as I say, if you if you feel more comfortable, you could also put it in the, the chat as well. If, if you'd prefer not to ask um, yourself. And as I say to the um, the link to the feedback will be emailed to you, <clears throat> excuse me, shortly after the session. And if you complete the feedback, you'll get an attendance certificate um, for for the session. Also, my contact details will be on there, Andrea Marlowe, and you'll be able to send me an email if you'd like, or and I can of course share it with the our, our fabulous panel from today. I do see Kate. If you are typing, if you want, you can feel free to to go ahead and unmute and and speak. Oh, no, sorry, I was just going to say thank you again. I've got a patient waiting <laughs> downstairs, so I've got to head off. Great. Right. Thank, thank you for joining us. <clears throat> I'd like to thank all of our uh, attendees for joining as well as to the panel. I appreciate it and for taking the time. And if you have any questions, you can always feel free to email us. We're available all the time. With that, we'll close this session and have you a, a great afternoon then. Thanks. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Thanks, thank Andrea. You.